coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, a legendary and iconic Nashville entrepreneur, Gary Forco. And now, Rich Redman. What's up, everybody? Rich Redman here. This is the Rich Redman Show coming to you live from Music City, USA, Crash Studios. So excited about having my next guest. He is the owner, 35 years, almost 36 years. Former owner. Former owner. (laughs) Uh, This was a big life change. Mr. Gary Forkham of Forks Drum Closet. Thank you so much for coming here and spending this time with us. And I've always wanted to do this because lifelong customer of, well, lifelong, but I've been in Nashville 23 years. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what everyone does their first day in Nashville. They drop by the Union, they (laughs) go see Music Row, and then they go to this destination drum shop called Forks Drum Closet. And um, so we're going to have a fun conversation about being a business owner and maybe the state of the music industry and what's happening in Nashville. Of course, we are joined by my co-producer and co-host, Mr. Jim McCarthy. Thank you. Jim McCarthy, (laughs) voiceovers.com. They cheer for me. Yeah. It's weird. I met met Jim because I was interested in about a decade ago, but in uh, being a voiceover artist and trying to like maybe cash in on these pipes here. And um, he was one of my first teachers and <laughs> thanks bud. And he does, a, and it is amazing, a monster truck ad. He does great financial ads. Financial ads, like the disclaimers? You, you, no, you definitely have a lane in your voiceover. Um, but we're, he's also a drummer. So we, we've yeah. had a lot of drummers in. This is, this is episode 10 for us. So, Tell us about how it all started, the drum bug for you. How did it happen? You catch it and never goes away. Uh, I guess the same story from everybody that was yeah. born in the late 50s, the Beatles. Okay. Yeah. You know. Ringo. 1964, yeah. right? Uh, yeah, February. Ed Sullivan. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. And Ludwig couldn't and keep I, those kits in stock. I can remember stock. doing a skit in class with those big pencils and lunch boxes, and I was... Using those as drones. Yeah. What song did they play? Uh, was it I Want to Hold Your Hand or what was That's it? That's what I thought yep. it was, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Mm. They did two Sundays in a row. Wow. That was a big time in big human deal. history. Big deal. Big deal. Big deal for me, too. And with the 36 years of you being a drum shop owner, I mean, are you, are you, you're celebrating. This is, is a celebration of sorts. Uh, I mean, that's an amazing run. Thank you. Well, yeah. Um, there were many drum shops that went out of business in Nashville during those 36 years. And not necessarily because of us, but just music retail is a tough business to be in. Oh, God. It's, mm-hmm. It seems like it's getting and tougher so and tougher. We had a lot of loyal people that helped us. And you know, it makes me think of a story of how you said you came to town, you yeah. went to the union, you came by the shop. You probably hooked up with Tommy Wells. Immediately. And went to lunch with him and yeah. he probably drove you around and showed yeah. you. Well, the, Tommy was a huge part of the success of Fork Drum Closet mm-hmm. because he welcomed everybody to town and was always hanging at the shop and making people comfortable and he was so showing them the ropes. Yeah. 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 Hmm. It really was a destination um, because for it's such a unique city, the music city, in the sense that we have recording sessions because it's one of the recording capitals of the world. And so you have a ten, you have three sessions a day, ten to one, two to five, and six to nine. And Tommy would be booked on all three of yeah. them, and yeah. then he would come and he would have his lunch or kill yeah. a little time, grab yep. a coffee, wait till uh, he'd kill time, waiting to go to the hockey game, or, yep. or just driving home in the traffic. He'd, yeah, he'd always be there. He was so sweet to me, and uh, Eddie Barris was sweet to me, Lonnie Wilson was sweet to me, and I tell everybody all the time, you know, if you stay in the game long enough, and you've you got a pure heart, and you're passionate, and you work hard, and you don't burn bridges, a lot of times your heroes will become your friends, mm-hmm. and, and that's what happened. I mean, crazy. And all those guys that you just mentioned, we had a cartridge company back oh. in the late 80s, early 90s, and mm-hmm. all those guys, like you said, were doing... Tens, twos, and sixes at different studios and all over town. And right. Milton Sledge. And, and Milton. Yeah. And Milton moved to Alabama? I think he went back to Muscle Shoals, I believe. Muscle Shoals. Yeah. That's yeah. where he's from. Now, where are you from originally? I'm from here. Oh, you're from Nashville? Believe it or not. Wow. One of the few people Whereabouts? associated. Uh, well, I, went, I, I was born at Vanderbilt Hospital. Grew mm-hmm. up uh, in the Glen Park area off of Brawley Parkway. Woodbine. Yeah, Woodbine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Went to Glencliff. 
So, yeah, not many of us that were native. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I've seen a See, lot of changes. Now it just takes about two or three years to become a native here. <laughs> yeah. So. I, I, you're not a Nashvilleian until you've done about two years, I think. Yeah. You, 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 <laughs> yeah. If you can survive those first two years, those were, that's, those were the tough years for me, man. I, you know, I worked a lot of day jobs. I mean, I had my tens of thousands of hours of experience, but I was like parking cars and mm -hmm. waiting tables and substitute teaching. And, mm -hmm. and it was, I always have fond memories of coming in and, and you always have hired like great people to work at your place. And I remember, thank you. Trey Gray would yeah. be there on his night side. And, yep. and, and Trey, for those of you guys that don't know, Trey was the drummer with Faith Hill. And um, now he's with Brooks and Dunn or mm -hmm. he's with Reba. Yeah, yeah both. Always working, mm -hmm. always working. But I would come in and they're like, what are you up to, Reba? Are you auditioning for anybody? You got any new gigs? Because I was always just like, you know, answering ads in the back of the scene. And I would meant the Nashville scene, which is our entertainment rag and I would be like yeah I ended up in some guy's basement yesterday it was like the silence of the lambs man it was scary and got the gig kind of a turn on got the gig though <laughs> those first yeah five years were rough <laughs> But we survive and we thrive, you know? And so you were in love with the drums and you love the Almond Brothers, right? They're, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and you have a band, the Midnight have, Riders. The Midnight Riders have been doing it for, I don't know, maybe 15, 16 years. Yeah. Now, who's the long. other drummer? Paul Snyder. Paul Snyder. Yep. Paul, How's Paul been? Paul's good. He worked with me at the store for 26, 27 years. He's, wow. He's at SIR now running the oh, drum department. Okay. <clears throat> I got to get over there. I mean, there's there was years in my experience in Nashville where I would spend a lot of time at SIR mm -hmm. rehearsing with up-and-coming acts mm -hmm. and stuff. Well, that's great to know. Yep. Very, very cool. And um, you fell in love with playing. You're from here. And I read somewhere you were thinking about maybe going to MTSU, but then you got the road education and started playing all the Holiday Inns. I played a Holiday Inn circuit in North Carolina for a year. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what did you learn to, from that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I saved a lot of money. I sent about 80% of my paycheck home. So mm -hmm. when I got through with that, I could be a little more discreet about the gigs that I chose. I had a little yeah. money to, to live off of. Yeah. Bought a van so I could haul my stuff around. Right. So it was worthwhile. The funny story is the Midnight Riders just played in North Wilkesboro sat two Saturdays ago. Mm -hmm. And we stayed at a nice New Hampton, but we looked across the street and there was what was left of one of those holiday inns that I played 42 years ago. Oh, wow. Yeah, wow. yeah it, was, it was empty. But yeah. <laughs> it was just an empty building waiting yeah, to be purchased. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So how do you go from, you know, you're being born here, you're raised around the environment, music is in your blood. Um, tell that story of how the whole store was born. You know, how, to, how did well, it come to be? I was after I came back from North Carolina, I was trying to put another band together, not successfully. Borrowed a PA from Corner Music, and I was trying to put this band together. Didn't happen. Had to bring the PA back, and I looked at Larry Garris, who owned Corner, and I said, You're not looking for any help, are you? He went, Yeah, yeah, I am. Come in tomorrow at 10. So I came in there and there were three of them working there at the time, and it was chaos. They were so busy, they didn't know what to do. That's the place great. was a mess. Yeah. So I kind of waited around for Larry to tell me what to do, and he was too busy to do that, so I just started cleaning up. And, you know, by the end of the day, I had it where we could walk around and get through the aisleways. And, yeah. And he said, come back tomorrow. So I started working for him, and uh, crazy enough, I was working on guitars for a while, doing fret jobs and changing out pickups wow. and that kind of thing then i started running the drum department and um he gave me a small budget and i remember i had a zildjian cymbal tree that held 12 cymbals so yeah after mm. a couple of weeks i'd sold them all that's great said, Larry, give me give me some more money to buy some cymbals so, well, i gotta pay gibson i gotta pay fender and you know I'll ask me next week so out of a frustration a little bit i finally said how about selling me the drum department he went Okay, well, let's take inventory and we'll figure out what it's worth. That's awesome. So it was. It was. It came up to eight thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. How a monster was born. <laughs> so I borrowed four, four from my uh, grandfather and four from my dad, mm -hmm. and um, started running it out of there. And we had a room. Oh, not even half this size. It was the closet. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and so the guys at Dog Percussion, which was Larry London's wife. Debbie's place 
they would jokingly say, how are things in the closet today? What's going on over there? So I, I decided to name it that. And um, even though we moved out, moved into a house across the street, moved over to 12th Avenue, uh, actually Larry London is the one that said, you're the only drum closet in the world. Don't don't change it. Don't change that. Yeah. So I thought that was good advice. For it became those, a really big closet over time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For those of you that aren't in the know are not musicians or drummers, Larry London was one of the, probably one of the busiest recording drummers in the Nashville scene. A uh, big bear of a man, yep. very warm, always wore Hawaiian shirts. Yep. Mm-hmm. And he played with people like uh, um, Steve Perry. Mm-hmm. He did the uh, O'Sherry record. He did a Journey record. And he yeah did a Journey record. R- raised on radio. I think. And then a lot of the stuff that you would hear on Nashville radio in the early '80s, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and then a lot of the pop stuff that came out of Nashville. Yeah, at the time. England Dan and John Ford Coley and some of that kind of stuff. And he hit hard. Yeah. Yeah. Big heavy sticks. Yeah. Big big man. Two Bs. <laughs> At least. <laughs> I tried two Bs one time and I I really felt like a caveman. Isn't that like playing with marching sticks? It's like playing with like Dennis Delucia sticks. <laughs> yeah. So uh you know, how did the business progress? I mean, did you have a did you envision this is what you wanted to do at the I time? I was really looking for a day gig to support my plane income. <laughs> yeah, Amazing you know, how that works. I wasn't one of those guys that slept till noon every day. I right. was always mm-hmm. up so if I could make some money to support my plane income. And I just got married, so I didn't really want to go on the road. Mm-hmm. And um, so probably the first three or four years, we didn't take any money out of the store. Everything we made, we put right back into it. And uh, I That's remember smart. I moved into uh, Corner Started in Berry Hill and all those little houses over there. Right. And when I the house across the street from corner became available and I said, well, how much is the rent? It was $355. Wow. Oh my God. How am I going to pay that? <laughs> <laughs> my God. You so figure it out. <laughs> yeah, we did. And we figured it out. And, um, and so, you know, we just, um, we stayed over there another couple of years and then we moved to 12th Avenue. Yeah. And 12th Avenue was very different back it then. It was a scary place. <laughs> It really was. Yeah, because that park over there was kind of, is kind of like the drug deal park. Yeah, and the the car wash down the street was another one. Wow. So, it's yeah. not the boutique little area it that what, it is It now. is not what it is today. Where's the car wash? Where is it? <clears throat> it's about where uh, Urban Grub is. Okay. Yeah, we have high-end barbecue uh, and, and boutiques. Oh, my gosh. And, Hipster crazy. Central. Hipster. So, mm-hmm. really, we were, Corner Music and Fort Strum Closet were one of the first shops or first stores like that to go over there and yeah and go into that battle zone and, yeah and carve something out and so. you guys got broken into oh and yeah you survived it i got robbed at gunpoint one time how'd you get out of that i just i said <laughs> hand it over i said don't shoot me yeah <laughs> here's, the, here's my i'm gonna uh, use a splash symbol like a ninja star <laughs> wow so really you learned the re the the ins and outs of, of music retail and business from Larry? Yeah, from Corner Music. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Larry was a great mentor and a good man and has is still at it today. Yeah. Did he sell? No. Okay. He's still well, in. he sold his building, but he, he bought a new building out on Dickerson Road. And okay. It's a really nice building, and and uh, they're, they're doing well. So 12th South happened uh, early 80s or? Yeah, 80, uh, 84, I think. And you were there ever since. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Until last year. Yeah, what I noticed that every time I would come in the store, you would find new creative ways to use the space mm-hmm. in a super efficient way. There'd be like an LP section and it would be like dangling from the ceiling and you would just maximize, but it always looked great. It was we used every inch of space. Yeah. It really did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then we were talking about the five-star drum shop concept. I, I don't know when that started, but the idea of qualifying to be a five-star drum shop, you would have to have um, a repair department, a lesson department, do educational events. Right. 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 What yeah. else is it? Uh, repairs. And repairs. Warranty, sir. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, rentals. That was kind of Jim Rupp and Rob Berenbaum's idea. Right. Uh, Jim owns Columbus Percussion mm-hmm. in Ohio, and Rob owned Drum Headquarters in St. Louis. Yes. And so they called me and Jim Pettit from Memphis and a handful of other guys, and kind of initially with eight or ten stores, and then the vendors kind of got involved. DW was really instrumental in, in helping us organize that and mm-hmm. they loaned us Dave Levine for a long time to help yes. manage it 
and did ads for us and mm -hmm. and it was a really good thing for a while um some of us wanted to make it more of a buying group and more of to use the power of 30 something drum shops with our vendors and others just kind of wanted it as a marketing tool like to be able to say like the great steak steakhouses of of the world you gotcha uh, in the back yeah. of southwest yeah Airlines. so i think initially when it started falling apart is that the old 80 20 rule where 20 percent of us were were buying and the others were just kind of mm. coattailing yeah mm -hmm. and i mean that in a bad way is yeah. maybe you know, that's just how it happens it's uh, you know. it's kind of human nature i think mm -hmm. so yeah but that was a really good thing for us for for quite a while um got us recognized with um not you know a, a lot of buyers around the country and i think brought us up with our vendors as well and you guys always were pushing the you know the forward thinking of of you know listing things on the website and being able to do ebay and then mm -hmm. reverb and mm -hmm. you know and I, I didn't know if you were able to listen to the symbols or the drums on like it's audio sample we had some of that especially yeah. with our used ones we, yeah we would sample them and if i was tight on the rent or something i would always bring in a snare drum or something you guys would make it you know doable and any repairs i had and you always had great folks there Just thank real, you yeah. that, that, i think that was one of the keys to our success is is the relationship the good people that that worked for us and yeah. they uh they all felt like family we had a staff meeting every Friday morning, and I, I, I allowed them to tell me what they thought about things and mm. ideas that they had, so they felt a part of it. And all, most all those guys are still working there today. Yeah. It's a, it's a good culture builder, yeah. allowing they know the freedom to, you know, uh, and it helps you as an owner, because otherwise knew, you don't know. I knew that they were all players yeah. and that they were going to keep playing, so... I'd always have maybe a few more employees than I actually needed because I knew one of them was going to come right. in and say, uh, I'm subbing for Rich next weekend. I got to yeah. go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you understood the nature of the beast yep. of the people. Yeah, it's yeah. almost like uh, being a waiter and being mm -hmm. an actor. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a nice, flexible place, <laughs> yeah. but you're around drums all the time. And what a hang. So yeah. cool. But, I mean, you, you you attracted a lot of good people that, that stayed with you for the long haul. And, and that's 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 creating a culture whether you knew it or not, mm -hmm. which is such a struggle for a lot of business owners now. You know, um, we're we're starting a company. We've been doing Big Dot now for uh, well since 2016. It's Big really Dot starting Lighting, to Big Dot Lighting and Electrical, um, and it's one of those things that yeah, we're struggling. Okay, how do we create a culture? You know, I know what not to do. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a it's a you know a testament. You know, and I applaud you on that that aspect well, of thank it. Thank you. Um, when you are building this and you're you're surrounded by drums. You know, and and this is something that you always did as a kid and coming up. Did you kind of you know just kind of get sick of looking at drums or did it fuel your fire no, for your passion? No, because I <clears throat> I always it seemed like every day something would come in there that I would go ooh. <laughs> <laughs> you might, got the toy I store, might have man. To hang on to that one. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you're a collector. <laughs> yeah, I've got a few drums. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is uh, there a Forks drum closet now at the homestead in Spring Hill? Uh, well, it's the, yeah, I have a music room that's got <laughs> a few sets in it. And, that's nice. And um, some snare drums. And I, got, I still have a room at my warehouse where I've got some stuff in it. So. Nice. <clears throat> yeah, because we talked, we were just talking to Harry, and he was talking about, like, you know, you work so, we sacrifice so many things, and we work so hard for our money. And he says, oh, I took some of my money, and I put it into real estate. And you can't go wrong. Yeah. Everyone says that, and and it's yeah. You got to have that. I mean, did you even, did you have any idea that putting it all in the real estate would turn into all of this, what's happening? No, I I knew early on. I bought my first house when I was twenty. Okay, so I That's, knew wow. I knew you know that that you you do a lot better if you buy rather than rent. Mm -hmm. But um, I bought on twelfth just so I could control what my location was. Right, you know, if you rent from somebody and they decide they want your space. And give you 30, 60 days to get out, and then you don't know where you're going to be. And I, I felt that I needed to be on 12th and, or, or next door to Corner Music because we had um, the whole band could come to that location yeah. and shop. Yeah. And so um, I bought it just so I could control my destiny or my location. Yeah. Had no idea that that 12th Avenue would go berserk. Yeah. Oh, it's being like, it's like being a restaurant tour. It's, it's essentially, it's, it's a little bit of a ball and chain. I mean, you really have to be overseeing things or have people that you really trust. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and 
yeah, the people that in my family that own restaurants, you know, the Greek pizzeria, they're like, oh, I had no life. We're you're married to it. Yeah. Married yeah. To it. yeah, you're yeah, married yeah. to it for sure. But but hey, we love it. I mean, we're selling drums. I mean, really, you're in the business of, you know. I tell people, what is my purpose in life? My purpose of life is to affect people in a positive way and to help try to change lives. I know that I can do that by providing entertainment for people. I know that I can do that by educating people mm -hmm. and passing on any knowledge from my experience. And you're in the business of changing lives. The guys need to have their drums repaired. They need to have, you have a rent, you had a rental service. Mm -hmm. Somebody comes into town, this is Music City, the songwriting capital of the world. They don't want, they can't fly their congas on the plane. And they're like, I'll just go to Gary. I'll rent the congas. You know, we, um, my family, um, they were all in the restaurant business. My, my wife, my son, and my daughter. And I realized that people in the restaurant business have a real work ethic. That they, they make really small hourly dollars. So they have to work for those mm -hmm. tips. Mm -hmm. So I remembered that when I would hire people. If you've been a bartender before, you've been a waiter before, or whatever. Yeah, I know that you know how to work. Right, and you know, that you, you if you, if you got time to lean, you got time to clean, right? So you, <laughs> and you yeah. could tell that restaurant people yeah. would find th stuff to do. Interesting, and work hard. Well, the restaurant people also have uh, relationship skills. Mm -hmm. You know, creating rapport with uh, the right. diners and the customers and stuff like that. I and mean, sales skills. Yeah, selling skills. Um, one of the people here, the, one of the new dealerships that just opened by the airport, Mercedes-Benz of Music City, their owner, and I've had him on podcasts, my own podcast as well, he talks about hiring from those service industries mm -hmm. to bring them into the car sales business. Because if I could train somebody who has the empathy for their customers, like a bartender or a waitress or something like that, or a server, uh, and and you know give them the opportunity to make good money doing what they do or what they did yeah that's yeah that, that's a very powerful combination mm -hmm. what is it what is a um job interview look like to come work at forks trunk Club? <laughs> <laughs> somebody would recommend their buddy hey you know what it's most of the time it was gut feeling i very seldom read the resumes yeah <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Would you say bring a resume? Just yeah, yeah I'll fill out an application because you know it got to where people were coming in every day, wow, looking for work. So we would keep them and we'd make notes, but uh, it really more was about just the gut feeling of yeah. how somebody interviewed. And yeah, what was the first big uh, you know competitor that came to town? Now one of the maybe one of the drum shops that didn't make it that you mentioned earlier. Uh, third, well, thoroughbred music, right? They came. I remember them. Wow. And Where were they again? They were out on uh, Gallatin Road on the north side. Okay. And then Mars Music. And then Mars came six months later. Mm -hmm. so and that was, I don't remember that. That was a big hit. They were at Hundred Oaks, um, up towards where the theater is. Yeah, they were like where um, Ross Dress for Less is yeah. now. Oh, really? And then Vanderbilt University has some stuff over there in yeah. that mall now. The Hundred Oaks Mall? It was 100 a 30,000 square foot store. It was a big store. Yeah. yeah. But that was before Guitar Center? Yes. Okay. And, but so the, so yeah. they... Sam Ash bought Thoroughbred, so they're still out there. Mm -hmm. uh, Mars went out of business, and we had a whole year without a GC or a Mars on our side of town, which was a really nice year. Yeah. yeah. And nice growth that year. And even when GC came, we didn't go backwards. We, it slowed our growth, but they get a lot of that entry-level business. That's, that's what they took from us. Right. You mean like uh, everyone's first drum set type yeah. of thing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, and you know, you know, I've done a million clinics at guitar centers, and I know a lot of the folks at guitar center. But I don't know if they're, um, I don't know if they put their employees through like rigid training, you know? Because I always say to myself, you know what? If I ever worked at guitar center, I'd be employee of the month the first day. <laughs> oh, you would yeah. sell the crap out of it. I, I would. I think it, I always have a career fantasy. It was like I would probably knock this out of the ballpark because right away talking to somebody, what are you looking for? Let's get it. Let's make it happen. That's not always my experience, though, going yeah. to retail place. Now, your store. Yeah, they had to love drums and yeah. and, get, and like people, get mm -hmm. along with people and enjoy talking about it. And, was there a and training? Trey, Trey Gray was, was a great salesman. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. you what know? do you, well, his personality is yeah. massive. Yeah. And he, he's a, he loves people. Mm -hmm. And that's a great thing to have in your on your side. Yeah, yeah, you got to, selling is people business, relationship <laughs> and empathy. Uh, I tell the story about the first time I met Greg Glazer, who was over at GC Pro, and yeah. uh, just a natural born salesperson. You know, he told me his story that uh, 
Uh, he was on, he kind of broke the mode of the, the typical guitar center employee by pledging to whatever I made that first year, I wanted to double it every year. Mm. So constantly doubling his income. Doubling, yeah. And, you know, that takes sales expertise, not understanding uh, how to keep in contact with people, reaching back out, um, and, and, you know, proper follow-up skills and, and asking the right questions. And, and when I got out of the car business, he wanted to hire me. I'm yeah. like, Dad, I don't want to go back to work on <laughs> weekends and... I'm good. <laughs> and nights. And so, yeah. They got a nice little building over there next to Treasure oh Isle. Oh, gosh. Yeah, it's really nice. <laughs> um, but, I mean, as they came in and you were, you know, had to contend with the big, the Wall Street behemoth. I had to diversify a little bit. I had right. to focus more on high end. Make sure that I had, if they had four or five DW kits in stock, I would have 15 to 20. Right. And I made sure to have all of those high-end snare drums, the Craviatos and the, the Brady's Nets and, and Brady's. Um, so you were the specialist. Yep. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we still had the entry-level stuff, and we were still aggressive with it. But, you know, we, we knew that that was going to be more and more going to GC and online. And yeah. moms are comfortable going into a department store, maybe yes. more so than they are in, into a specialty shop like mine. So, yeah. And we tried to battle that somewhat with... Uh, with my wife working there and Jenny worked there and yep. my daughter Jamie worked there. So we had some women that worked at the store that to, to make that easier, you right. know, make women feel more comfortable in there. Cause you oh, know, let's face it. Yeah. It's a, it's a guy Male dominated guy, business. Yeah. 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 So, so, you, so your business starts, you know, getting some, uh, did you get a lot of price objections, that kind of thing in terms of, uh, you know, maybe Guitar Center kind of undercutting and, and being more of a volume player? Yeah. And they were being <clears throat> very aggressive. They had meetings about, let's put forks out of business. Ouch. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So some things they were selling at cost or below. Loss leaders. Yeah. 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 So that that's part of the stuff. But a lot of our loyal customers will come over and say, this is what I got quoted. Can you match it? Right. Or even can you come close to it? Mm -hmm. Because wow. they still wanted to buy it from us. Yeah. But that was, that, was a lo that was a loss to you, though. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So how did you overcome that? I mean, it got to a point where I would just say, hey, guys, look, here's my cost on it. I can't stay in business doing that. Right. I do it at 10% above or something. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. to, to keep your business. And most of the time they would say, well, they don't have it in stock anyway, so I'll, <laughs> I'll get it from you. Yeah. Now, weren't you one of the nation's, uh, like, highest volume DW sales? So, like, we, lots, We right? won that award a few times. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. We focused really heavily on DW and had a great relationship with, with everybody out there. That's another family-owned company that, that we could really relate to. Yeah. You know, Don and Chris and... And everybody out there always you pushing, know, pushing good, the limit and people. never mm -hmm. accepting, always pushing mm -hmm. for innovation. And then also, you know, using education, Jim and I talk about it all the time, using education essentially as a marketing tool. It's a great way for community outreach and to keep the, the shop. But you always had clinics over at Soundcheck. Mm -hmm. You had, you'd have Sukerman and, and Chris Coleman and big, huge names, and the whole community would come out. There was a lot of them. I made a list one time. We sat down with a couple of my guys and tried to remember all the clinics that we'd had, and it was... Hundreds? Yeah. It's probably thousands. Yeah. yeah. It, was, it was a lot of people. Yeah. How many clinics a year would you do? Uh, in the busy years, probably four or five. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, because they're expensive. You don't always make money off of them. Did yeah. you network with other stores around the country that were similar to yours? Mm -hmm. other, yeah, they would, like they even would music put stores? Tours together, you know, for gotcha. clinicians so they could uh, save money on it. But Were you familiar with the East Coast Music Mall in Danbury, Connecticut? I've heard of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ed Roman. Yeah. You know Ed? You were in the Ed Roman Guitars. He had a TV show out in Vegas for a while. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, you know, I was just thinking of some of the big stores around the country that it used to get you know, name drop in our store. Uh, and that was one of the reasons that I started this, the business initially as well, because I realized how many people were shopping out of town. Mm -hmm. but they were uh, uh, well, Atlanta Pro Percussion mm -hmm. and Rhythm City in Atlanta. I mean, that guy was putting Yellow Page ads in the Nashville. Oh, Yellow really? <laughs> he was trying wow. to get a deer. Yeah. Wow. So and, did Atlanta Pro just go out of business? Yeah. Oh, wow. Manny's and... New York Sam City. Ash and... Chuck Levins. Remember Zampinos? Was yeah. That, yeah. That was like so. Some, all of those yeah. people were, a lot of people in town were shopping with them because of the discount. So if I could match it and keep the business here in town, 
so that's another reason that we that we were able to hang in there what other things did you do to employ i mean in the absence of value there's no price too low in the presence of value there's no price too high that's a great saying that we always try and use in our business and even you know uh, being such a boutique business what did you add to the experience if anything you know in the selling process there's like, for example, <clears throat> we have two Highline Mercedes dealerships in town, mm -hmm. right? One is more price-centric. The other is they really hold to their MSRP mm -hmm. uh, and, and try and sell with gross involved. But you get the luxury experience because they can pay for it. They, mm -hmm. They're holding their gross. They've got trained salespeople that know how to sell, that understand that if the customer has got to, you know, they're, they're more buying into the experience. Was that something that you kind of got into your business over the years, the experience? I think we tried to do both. Right. We tried to match the, the discounted places and spend the time with them. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we could take the drum set in the back room, set it up for right, them, right, and play right. and try out cymbals and things. Tuning lessons. We, mm -hmm. Many times we delivered kits to people's houses for them and help them set them up. That's so awesome. Wow. Whatever, whatever we could do to get the sale. Oh, big time. And you've always had great teachers there. Harry Wilkerson, yep. uh, Steve Eby. Yep. Uh, Nick. Uh, Chester Thompson. Yeah. Chester Thompson. Jake. I mean, you've always got guys teaching there. What a great resource. <laughs> I get, went there one time and I saw on the wall that I can get a lesson from Chester Thompson and or Johnny Rab. And I was like, are you serious? Yeah, they're just hanging out in the back, man. Right. Eating sandwiches, <laughs> waiting for you. <laughs> yeah, we, we, had, we had at one time probably close to 200 students a week coming through there. Wow. And that's wow. smart because on the way out, Oh, mm -hmm. you got you got to get this book. Yep. You got to get a uh, Ted Reed book. You got to get some uh, SD one generals. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know, so to me, you know. let's fix that Glockenspiel. You know, Christmas. The, what was the one in? Uh, there was one in New York because I, I grew up in Connecticut, mm -hmm. and uh, we had choices. If I wanted to get a really good experience with buying a drum set or, or having a little bit more selection than East Coast Music Mall, which was like it was. They didn't really take the drum department very seriously. Yeah. I mean, it was guitar central. Mm -hmm. uh, we would go down to Sam Ash and White Plains, or if we got really bold, we went down to Manny's in Manhattan mm -hmm. and Sam Ash. Sam Ash was like pretty much just carbon copies of each other. Yeah. But there was another place that I had discovered in Nyack, New York, and it was called the Long Island Drum yeah. Center. Yeah. Yes. Remember those guys? Sure. Still in biz. There, were, there was five of those at one time. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. Uh, it was right across the tap and Z okay. and the guy there was like, you know, similar to you guys. I would rather buy from them because they were knowledgeable. They could train you. Mm -hmm. They'd let you play the kits. Yep. Oh my gosh. And they were so, they sounded so good. Dennis Ricky had the one on, you know, on Long Island, the, mm -hmm. the, the larger one. And, um, Are they still in business? I think so. I could have sworn like, like yeah. one time Liberty DeVito was like, come on, you got to check, you know? Yeah. Well, I'm going to check. I'm pretty sure they are. <laughs> I think they are. But there was a guy there that uh, I can't remember his name, but always just a, you know a fixture. I don't mind always count them. ever supporting, even if they pay more, supporting the family-owned business. Always. Because you're getting all those extra things. Well, and we need more people to think that way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because I would never make still somebody, there? I would never. I don't think I've ever came in and raked you over the coals for price. I just... Paid the car. I just whatever you need. That, that's it. Well, and he lets me do that when it comes to buying his cars. <laughs> yeah, for cars you got. I'll take be him. the bad guy. We were pretty aggressive on the, on the pricing too. Yeah. I mean, we yeah. knew what our what our uh, enemies were selling them for, yeah. so yeah. we made sure that we we matched or yeah. or were better even. See, we we when I sold Mercedes, we had uh, we contended with other Highline dealerships that hold that had you know pre-owned cars, but the main one was Global, and they were you know a boutique Highline uh, used car type of dealership, mm -hmm. and uh, we would get customers all the time that would come in and say, well, I can get the you know you got this 2013 E350, they've got it you know, the exact same car. Mm -hmm. Uh, for two thousand dollars less, and as a car salesman, you really had to know how to close. You, otherwise, you didn't need. You know, I didn't get paid if I didn't sell anything. Mm -hmm. So you had to learn closing techniques. And one of them I learned was like, well, okay, I understand, completely get it. But you know, we're the ones that have the certified pre-owned program that right. the, the brand stands behind. Right. Um, you know, does that make a difference? Well, you know, I can get it. I said, well, we're the ones who do the reconditioning and the maintenance on their cars. They bring them to us because we have the tools. We're the ones who are certified. We know what they yay and what they nay, okay? 
Um, so I would say, well, you know, with all things being the same, who would you rather buy it from? Because you're here talking to me. Well, we'd rather buy it for you, from you. And I'd go, great. Wh why is that? Well, because it is certified. Great. Why else? Oh, you're testing them and you're flipping I, it. I would sit. I'd sit there and just, I would. I would use this club whenever we had a, a competitive type of situation with another dealership. I would. I'd always bring them down this road and be like, "Great, why else? Great, why else? Mm -hmm. Great, why else?" Oh, but my favorite of yours is, uh, "What's keeping you from purchasing this vehicle? <laughs> What's the one thing preventing you? Yeah. What's yeah. the one thing holding you back?" But from you know, I never forward? saw any like I never saw hard sales tactics at Forks. It was always like people no. need sticks, they need heads. You're <laughs> yeah. coming in to do it. But I never. I don't think I ever hung around long enough to see someone purchase a whole drum set. Mm -hmm. So they come to you and they go, I, "You see that little drum set in the window right there? I want that." And then what happens? You say, well, that's the price. And we'd love for you to take it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some, sometimes I'll just take it like it is. Sometimes they'll say, what's my price? And, mm -hmm. you know, and we, we work with them. So, <laughs> yeah. I, I remember, you got to make a little money. You know, yeah, you got to. You know Kevin uh, Rapilla. Yeah. <clears throat> he came from Boston. His band came in the store. And uh, he kept looking at this kit. He goes, man, I'd really like to have that drum kit. I just don't know. I said, are you playing in town tonight? He said, yeah. I said, well, why don't you take it and play it tonight? Oh, uh, you puppy dog closed them. And, 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 uh, <laughs> and then if you don't like it, bring it back tomorrow. And, uh -huh. you know, and <laughs> that's he, great. He loved it. And, you know, he was a loyal customer forever. And, that's a closing technique, man. <laughs> yeah. I, I knew he wanted it. And mm -hmm. I knew that that was the only thing. He just needed to hear it and play it with his band. He needed to play it on stage. And Yeah. And from his band from Boston. This must have been twenty years long ago. Long time ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's a smart idea. But I mean, you know, even having the notion of, of having big names that are buying from you and like, hey, if we're good enough for them, we're good enough for everybody mm -hmm. else. Um, when the online giants started springing up, you know, how did you you know, all of a sudden, okay, we're weathering the storm with Guitar Center. Now we've got Sweetwater. We've got this. We got you know Amazon. Mm -hmm. Well, you guys My got in the, you guys got in the game with the online sales. We yeah. did, but again, it was harder and harder to sell the low end stuff mm -hmm. because there's just not enough profit in there when you're, and they didn't have to pay tax for a long time. Right, 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 right. And, and we have to charge tax, mm -hmm. and uh, and then when you got into free shipping, it just it wasn't worth it. So yeah, yeah. your lunch again. We focused on the higher end stuff or the, you know, we focused on Gretsch for a long time. Gretsch was the very first company that opened me up because nobody wanted it back in in eighty two. Those are your favorite <laughs> drums, yeah. right? That's You're a what Gretsch. I play, yeah. And uh, so for years and years there were. Uh, Paul Cooper at Gretsch told me there were only about six dealers in the country that were selling any Gretsch drums. Us, Memphis, Hollywood Pro Drum, Columbus, you know, uh, just a handful of people. Yeah. Sell me on Gretsch, okay? Like, take me down the pathway. Why do you like Gretsch so much? Make me, make me a believer. You know, their slogan is that great Gretsch sound. That's absolutely true. There's mm -hmm. nothing that sounds like them. It's got that mid-thump. Yeah. And there's a... Uh, there's just a, a thing about it, the look, the wood finishes, uh, the die cast hoops, and you, you think of Charlie Watts, and you think of all the, a lot of the old jazz guys that played them, and there's just an image about them that is always cool to me, but but ultimately, it's the way they sound. Yeah. And see, I, I was like always, you know, coming up, a, you know, I'd always see the ads for Pearl, for Tama. Mm -hmm. I was kind of a hard rock, heavy metal guy. Um, Ludwig was one of the big ones you'd see early sure. on. You know, Alex Van Halen played uh, Ludwig drums, and, and the logo just was so cool, mm -hmm. you know. But you'd see the the logos for Pearl, and the, the, the big positioning statement was, you remember what it was? The best reason to play drums. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And Zildjian, the only serious choice. I mean, these My are gosh. They got went bold, from bold statements. Oh, big time. Yeah, they had to be. And they owned it. I always had a trouble. I always had trouble with uh, uh, diecast hoops. I know it keeps the drum more focused and better in tune, but just wailing away on rim shots on the. It's just a on the snare drum. On a snare yeah, drum. I'm with you there. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't care. Triple flange on the snare. Yeah, or the Singerman <laughs> stick saver. So for there. the layman who's watching, <laughs> <laughs> die cast tubes are like muscular, and triple flange would be kind we, of like you yeah. want more feel out of it. It's but yeah. That's part of the sound though. Is that thin gret shell mm -hmm. with the die cast tubes, and it would sing more. I yeah. guess, right. Yeah. Okay. And, and the tuning range on them is pretty incredible. Massive. I mean, most of the time everybody tunes them up high for jazzy type stuff, but they sound great. 
you yeah. know, tuned any, anywhere, medium and low, whatever. See, yeah. I pick up the drum. You've got the 18-inch uh, DW over there. And yeah. I just picked it up the other day and thumped it with my thumb and yeah. had that low and growl. Like, oh, my gosh. I can yeah. never get a drum to sound like that. And the folks at DW are essentially, they purchased the Gretsch brand. Yep. And um, Oh, did they? Yeah. I was not aware of that. I actually think Fred still owns the name, but they own the manufacturing part of it. Interesting. So, is it as what were they American made? Yes. Okay. Savannah, now, Georgia, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Uh, let's see. Was it Savannah, Georgia? Yeah, it is Savannah, but it's uh, I can't think of it. It's right outside. Yeah. Of it. it's right. Yeah. Yeah. Town, but um, everybody's hardware comes from overseas, though. Mm -hmm. you know, it's metal. Yeah. yeah. You can't. Yeah. You can't compete if you make yeah. rims and hoops and yeah. and tension casings and stuff in the states at, the, at this point so but so, everything else is the wood the shells are made here and it's assembled and painted and everything here yeah no, i mean no, no matter how you 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 think about it like drums even at the, the cheapest level these entry level kits it really adds up because like people have approached me all the time they're like you know you know keith urban's been selling that guitar on late night like play guitar tonight with mm -hmm. keith urban and you get this great looking guitar and his educational system everyone's like dude Chris McHugh is actually the guy that's like, you need to do play drums tonight with Rich Redmond. You're the perfect guy for this. <laughs> and, and you get the thing. I agree. The thing is, it's like, okay, coming up with the with the, 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 the training system, no problem. We have the technology to get. But getting someone to do seven easy payments of ninety nine ninety nine. <laughs> that's you. I mean, it's a 700. If to put my name on something that is quality, that's going to sound good. Yeah. And then the, then when you start getting into symbols, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. where the, then that goes up. Yeah. So it makes it okay. So what would it be? An electronic drum set, you know, or when does the drum, you can't do it model. When does the drum manufacturing model become a subscription? Cause cars are getting into that now. You can subscribe to a car. Interesting. Yeah, you didn't know that. Mm -mm. Yeah, you can. You can. You can do it. Do it um, through Mercedes. Mercedes, BMW, Audi. A lot of the high end cars are doing it. <clears throat> you can actually pay a monthly. Uh, there's no credit check because it's off of a credit card. Uh, you have a bucket of cars to choose from. So you, uh, I think, for like. 1049 a month for Mercedes, you get their C class level, their lowest level. Uh, your insurance is included. Wow maintenance is included there's no limited mileage uh and you can change out of the car at any time there's actually a guy i heard that when he runs out of gas he goes to the app pulls up another car they bring it out to him full tank of gas he never buys gas wow <laughs> but he doesn't have to deal with people so he no. does it all <clears throat> you can literally go on your phone and, and that's what scares me about <clears throat> all of the online business is, yeah. is that the relationships and the the, the care that I think there's always going to be somebody that's going to want yeah, the relationship. You, the way you just described Gretsch was the way the guy at Long Island Drum Center described the drums. I mean, he went into detail about yeah. how the the layers of the wood were, you know, cross heat infused with the glue and and the bearing edges were cut a certain and I was just sitting there just watching him. <laughs> I do it. I'm you're telling me a story here. And they're not just a drum anymore. They're like a living, breathing. And some, it's it's organic material, right? And it was made with craftsmanship. That's but that's but the selling aspect of it was what? Okay, yeah, you got me. Yeah. I'm buying from you. And then isn't you know acoustic drums have taken a hit because of electronic drums? Sure. Right. So, yeah. and you guys always had a nice section, rolling products. We did, and but releases. it was always a very small per percentage of our drum sets. So, so damn expensive. That's where Guitar Center was fifty percent of theirs. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, the next time Roland came out with a kit, it was—I mean, what do I have? Like a twelve thousand dollars kit now? They do have a twelve thousand dollars kit. <laughs> yeah. I got one sitting over there. I don't know. I mean, they've got so many models now. You know. Oh my gosh. I had one. I had. A, this is going way back. I had a Roland TD twenty. Yeah. Um, drum module. That's not with, too far back. It wasn't too far back, but it was Heart Dynamics pads. Oh yeah, with I the actual those. real symbols, the plastic symbols. Well, and I felt guilty for having it. Simmons was the first that yes. I remember, mm -hmm. and I had um, uh, tennis elbow. A, a young guy working for me. <laughs> yeah, that horrible. Uh, Hunt, Hunt, Hunt I just Wall, got that. Hunt Wall was his name, and his dad used to travel to England all the time. Well, he bought a kit for us and brought him back in his luggage, and. 
we rented them enough in the early days to pay for them because they were pretty expensive. They were $3,500 or something. Mm -hmm. And a lot of Nashville guys were like, "Eh, I'm not sure that this is going to last. I don't know if I want to spend that kind of money. So we rented and and paid for them that way. But there was a period when I looked at my shop and I went, I had a Tama Tama electronic set, a Pearl set, a Roland. And I'm like, this is not why I got into this business. I don't like this stuff. (laughs) Remember when Pearl was making cymbals? Uh, well, they were from Sabian, actually. Were they? Yeah, but they had pearl, pearl branding on them. On them. Yeah. 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 yeah, Well, I mean, it went from the octa, the the sextuplet, sextuplet, the um, octobonds, not the octobonds, the oh, uh, hexagon. Like, trigger, is it hex? Yeah. Trigger pad. The six sided Simmons pads. Oh, wow. right. Is that yeah. a hex? Yeah, that's hex. Yeah, the hexagon mm-hmm. pads, right? Alex Van Halen had them on uh, uh, Live Without a Net. 5150, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, Crystal Pepsi. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. And then, you know, the successor to that was D-Drum. Yep. Where they was using real drum pads. I really enjoyed playing D-Drums. They Did felt you? good. The samples yeah. were nice. Yeah. They at least felt somewhat like yeah, it, was, it was like a practice pad. It wasn't a mesh head. I remember. What, what was the Linda Ronstadt song that had to? Boom, um, boom. <laughs> uh, Russ, it was Russ Kunkel. It's on yeah. our greatest hits. Yeah. I, I, I had what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> and Larry London had some of that yeah, stuff. He, he was, was, oh yeah, he was always right. at forward the thinking edge on that. Rick yeah. Allen, I think that I mean he had to go to mm-hmm. electronics. You know, mm-hmm. I mean it's not going away. They call it hybrid drumming now. So having some awareness of that stuff and being able to a lot of churches and all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. I don't get enjoyment out of playing electronic yeah. drums. It's not as visceral. It's not as I don't have the connection with the instrument, but I'm not opposed to if the job demands that it's fine. But for the most part, a lot of times that collects dust over there. But if I, somebody like a composer sends me a thing and they're like, Hey, can you do the session in MIDI? I have the technology to do it. We go into Pro Tools, bun, done. Yeah. You know? I, I compare it to in our Almond Brothers tribute band, we use a real B3. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, Nothing sounds like that. Nothing fills up the stage. Nothing, yeah, sounds like it's a not when you. It's like a uh, a sampling, yeah, virtual it, it, organ, and I, that's the same way with drums to me. Not to again to the layman, to the people who are listening that don't understand what we're talking about. Yeah. Simmons drums back in the day was literally a lot, like imagine a a rack of books in front of you, yeah. okay, and you'd hit your drumstick on like a solid surface from mica kitchen countertop, countertops, and, countertops yeah. yeah exactly and it's and, it, and you you saying tennis elbows is hilarious because it's so true it yeah. really gave everybody problems <laughs> it really did well and then we started buying quarter inch gum rubber mm-hmm. and gluing them on there and helped a little bit but yeah still not it was like a practice pad not at that point yeah but then roland comes around and what do they do they make them into tennis rackets mm-hmm. Yeah, mesh heads, mesh, mesh. Yeah. which which feel a lot better. I got mesh in me right now, guys. I had well, the, actually, uh, I had the surgery. The Roland had the rubber pants for a while. <laughs> I had the uh, groinal uh, her- hernia, and I think that's from moving drum sets and B threes. The B three is a career killer. Yes. Was it was it from hitting the the big kick drum Simmons pad? <laughs> I you know I never had a Simmons kit. You know I came in on the D drums, mm-hmm. but um, you know did you some- have a D drums kit? There was a couple of studios around town where I would do things and the guys had... The D-drums. The D-drums, yeah. 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 What a fun... You know, the New Forks the, the new Forks Drums Closet is at 310 Chestnut. That's correct. It's over in uh, Wedgwood, Houston area, which is a really nice... They're emer- as an emerging neighborhood. They're growing faster than 12th did. I think that... Apple Music is going over there, mm-hmm. and I think that the Soho House is going over there, which is in kind of an exclusive members members only subscription subscription nightclub. The which Kings are, of Leon on that little uh, where building else? across the yeah. street. I think they have their studio in. They got some nice cocktail lounges, some really nice uh, four star restaurants. Mm-hmm. It's a really nice spot over mm-hmm. there. Really, really. Mm-hmm. And and um, are you, are you basically you staying on like as a consultant? And, uh, yeah, yeah, I have a little bit. Yeah, mm-hmm. not a lot. I think they know what they're doing in there. Yeah, it looks beautiful. If they need me, they. they I have not so. been by there yet. Got to go. Got to go. Yeah. So you get to the you get to the point where okay, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna step down from this thing. Tell me what that's like. You know, what was the thought process? God, so it? nosy, Jim. It was a it was a couple years <laughs> in the making. Yeah. And um, I started to feel. I would come into work and I, my motivation was going away and mm. I was burnt and uh, and you know online business the, uh, Amazon has affected everybody's business sure uh, and and just with the Nashville growing the way it has probably double or triple 
the the drummers that play for artists have endorsements now mm-hmm. that before only maybe the top echelon interesting guys would get free stuff but everybody that had any kind of decent gig had an endorsement mm-hmm. and i'm talking sticks and cymbals and heads and drums and everything so it got to be where more we were just a place to hang rather than a place to buy. You're like, hey guys, go so hang out somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, we don't there's mind a, you coming. There's a coffee yeah. shop there, there's a coffee shop there, and there's a coffee shop there. Well, and but, but we loved all those guys, and we wanted them to hang there. And when they did buy something, they bought it from us, and they sent people to us. So it wasn't a total loss that way, but I could I could see it coming. From a business owner perspective, you're like, oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah. yeah. And um, I'm 61 now, so I was just thinking... So young. I don't know if I want to do this when I'm I mean, 70. You it's know, a so. wonderful time to... I'm, I'm not going to say you're retired, but you have new interests. You yep. own a farm and yep. you have grandkids. And it, to me, this sounds like, wow, the, the best years of your life, you know... I agree. It's been a great year. Wonderful. It's, it's been... I haven't regretted it one bit. I, I do miss my friends. I miss seeing a lot of people. And, yeah. You know, the, I remember we had a big party out at the, the farm a couple of years ago. Like yeah, maybe we got one coming up September the 1st. Really? It's called Fork Fest. Checking my schedule. The first? Oh. It's a Sunday night before Labor Day. Oh, man. We do it every year. I think I'm free, too. We have uh, <laughs> two or three bands play. It's September 1st? Yeah. I'm doing this. What, what time? Am I invited? <laughs> yes, you are. It's six o'clock. Fork Fest. <laughs> That's at Spring Hill? We'll have barbecue. <clears throat> yeah. You can come by so, and see the kids before yep. This is great. I'm so glad I asked. Man, He's putting it in his calendar. Oh, it's, 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 I think it's, it's our 13th year of doing this. Have you done it? Oh, so you've done it done it every year, but I yeah. haven't been there in so long. I'm well, doing this. is great. And this is on your property in Spring Hill? Right. Really? In your band place, yeah, the yep. Midnight Riders. Yep. We have a, a pole barn that we built in a, a field right beside the house. And You know, I know so, a guy who knows Jason Aldean. He might be able to get you there. No kidding. You know? <laughs> What? <laughs> well, have him sit in. Oh, he loves it because he loves the Allman Brothers. Yeah, yeah. We Come we on. went we went down to Macon because I think Jason is he's in the Macon Music Hall of Fame, really? and we went down and visited the Allman Brothers Museum there. Yeah, and big he, house. he did a he did an interview and just got to see all the stuff. That's cool. Then. So wait, really. he's in the so he was he's I, there for Macon Music. And, well, his, music. his publishing company is called Macon Music. Get Macon it? Macon Music yeah. Hall of Fame. <laughs> and the Georgia, Georgia Music... Shazam! ...was in Macon. <laughs> That's Johnny Hole, my drum tech. you know Johnny? Yeah. Oh, he's such a great kid. <clears throat> so Johnny um, from afar. Yeah, the Big House is a great museum. Really cool. It's, uh, if, if people who don't know... Dwayne and Greg and Barry Oakley all lived there mm. and the band rehearsed there and lots of great stories and they've got a lot of the furniture and got Dwayne's room set up just like it was set and, lists and yeah that's got lots incredible. of gear drums and, and just little things like checks written for a uh, 50 watt Marshall and, yeah you know, it's a good cool one pictures. there's a lot of museums there's so many museums in LA like of weird things mm-hmm. like um you know the the museum of divorce and, you know, and, you <laughs> really? know, and, and yeah they have strange museums <laughs> they really do this is this is worth your time the museum of divorce they, they have weird museums uh, <laughs> that's awesome that is well, so funny and, and i have something that jmo one of the drummers in the yes. brothers band gave me a front head that he had done some artwork on that's great sent it to me one day out of the blue didn't even know it was coming and i had it hanging in my office for a long time and then when they sold the store, I thought people should see this, so I loaned it to the the big house, and it's it's hanging on the wall down there. It's awesome. So, well, then I saw it. Yeah. Well, owning one of the biggest drum stores in history. I mean, I, I before we started, I told you I used to read uh, you know stories about uh, your store from different articles, but of course, seeing the the uh, iconic advertisement in Modern Drummer magazine. Did you ever get the you know I've got just everything i ever need i could build the you know the, the biggest drum kit to make terry bozio salivate you know do you ever have that hankering of just you know <laughs> play, i'm, I'm gonna make a four-piece kit <laughs> right I mean, but you know i am too I, that's that was the one thing when i was gotta, a kid you got to be really good at at target a target yeah. practice yeah. but i mean you know i used to see you know neil's kit that iconic picture of the river and yeah. you know the, the the tom's going i wanted that so bad yeah. i had it all mapped out 
you know. Yeah, all that's that's cool until you have to start hauling in. Around. I know. Oh, God, <laughs> I could show you a picture of my kid that I had in high school, and it was like, yeah, it was not very roadie friendly at all. I think one year I want to do the um, instead of one up, two down. It might be nice to have three up top, one down. I've always been to do that setup at some point. Mm-hmm. Three up, two down. Three up, two one. Really? Down. Yeah, like three, like Bing, like, Bing, Boom, Boom. The Liberty set. The Liberty yeah, the set. The yeah. twelve, thirteen. That used to be. The Liberty set is what that yeah, is. Yeah, Liberty. We love. I, I remember all the different drummers I would emulate in my kit. I mean, in the beginning, it was. Uh, well, I guess you could say it was more like an Alex Van Halen type of approach. Then I got introduced to Rush. I used to think all the people that my brother was in a cover band and the guys he was in the band with were all Rush fans. Mm, yeah. And I would come in, you know, the, the young, you know, snot, you know, his bro, little snot nosed brother, uh, be like, well, you know, Neil's not as good as Alex. <laughs> and they'd be like, dude, really? You it's know? when people talk about what is the best, who is the best. I know. You can't do it. You what can't do you, quantify it. You talk about the guy that plays ballads well, or are you guys talking <clears> about like the, the the best tuning or the best looking drum set or the fastest or like, what, what is the best right. drummer? So, I mean, you know, I would, I got introduced to a show of hands and I was going, oh, this guy is pretty good. You know, he was doing stuff like, you know, the crossovers to the high intents and subdivisions. And uh, I looked at his drum kit and I'm going, okay, that's what I want now. <laughs> you know, so I'd go to the East Coast Music Mall and I would talk to Stick. That was his name. That's nice. Yeah, his nickname was Stick. <laughs> um, and he, and he, you know, he, he would sit there and just humor me. I was probably 13, 14 at the time and be like, I want to have, you know, a ton, I want to have acoustic drums across the front of me and I'm going to have the electric drums just beyond those drums so I could actually hit those drums, <laughs> you know. And he had, had the whole thing planned out and he'd sit there and price the whole thing for me and eh, it's going to cost, you know, $11,000. I'm like, oh my God, mm-hmm. I'm never going to get that. You know, yeah. we have some of the best drummers in the world in Nashville. If you just think about it. We really do. Think about uh, Ron Ganaway. Talent pool. Greg Morrow. Billy Thomas. Yep. <laughs> I mean, Billy plays behind Vince, so he, a lot of times it's brushes, and but that man can play. That man can play. I remember uh, substitute teaching in 1998, and I was, uh, see, I think I was teaching this, maybe the fifth or sixth grade that day and and this kid goes what do you do I'm like i play drums he's like oh yeah my dad is a drummer played for vince gill <laughs> 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 those first couple years tough there you go look at that jim there it is That's 18, great. 18 years old hey like, can you flash that when you edit this episode i can i'll, I'll yeah i'll put that up <laughs> for sure uh, flash it towards the camera that's just way too much to set up man. i know oh uh, yeah and i and i and i towed that thing around red pearl power red toms, right? exports yeah yeah power toms yeah. the deep toms mm-hmm. i definitely love the um the color and the and the mullet i had a mullet there <laughs> a v05 mullet i had I one had, too man i had a mixture of peisty symbols because i was a big alex van halen guy and zildjian yeah and and the piccolo snare drum yeah. Because that Pearl Jam was big at that point, and piccolos were coming into style. You know, Stuart Copeland sold more piccolo drums for, I mean, he didn't play a piccolo drum. I mean, he just had a 5 by 14 and he cranked it. Yeah. <laughs> but everybody came in and buying piccolos. And, and I think things. Aaron Comus with the two princes, the spin doctors. Oh and uh, let's see, I think Pop. I think that year was Two Princes would have two been princes was, uh, 89 or 90. Uh, was it? Yeah. I thought it was early 90s. Might have been 90, 91 to 92. Could be. But anyway. Yeah. Uh, that was a free floating yeah. piccolo snare. Yeah. Because that mattered. Yep. What a gimmick. <laughs> Gosh. Well, you Did it even have, make you a could difference? buy three different shells to put in that drum. Did you know that? Yeah, that's right. It was the, the brass and wood and birch and, and maple. Maybe copper. Or, it was, there were different shells that you could buy to put you in. You don't realize until later that. Any good front of house sound man, sound man can make a CB seven hundred kit sound great. Oh yeah, a pearl ex- <laughs> a pearl export with some nice heads and a guy who knows how to tune. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I I talk about the DW stuff all the time. It's like, you know, I play their high end drums, but I think their performance series and their design series are crushing. Yeah, and so when kids like, I'm going to send my kid to college and I want to buy him his first nice drum set, I'm like. Get him a performance series. Kid will be able to play all the styles. It's affordable. The finishes are killer. Mm -hmm. They're crushing it. They really do. And their commitment to education. And John, Don with the drum channel and all that. It's just so great. It's a great company. What do we we bring up the other day with, uh, was it Danny? I think it was with Danny. Um, Uh, Danny Gottlieb? Gottlieb. Yeah. We were talking about the... uh, the Lake Superior wood mm-hmm. that they found. I'm mm-hmm. gone, and when I that's when I knew. 
That's guys, really. That's a serious know. wood geek. Oh, yeah. but that's the thing. It's <laughs> but, like you know, this this wood is going to make your drum set sound that much. You know, and well, what's the price? It's only an extra six thousand dollars per drum. Well, I have friends. Know? I have friends who have great day jobs, and they're surgeons and they're lawyers, but yeah. they play drums, and those are usually you know John Good usually sells to those yep. guys, yep. and it's exactly. great. You know, the guys who can. Well, they don't much. want it, and you don't take it to the corner bub to play Brown Eyed Girl. <laughs> no. You you keep that in your man cave. Put it in your music room, and but and what you, what is the one thing you just you, enjoy? It. We have eight thousand dollars worth of gear that you pack into your five hundred dollar car <laughs> for fifty. Play for fifty. Play for fifty bucks. Yeah, I can't tell you how many drum sets we sold that had to match the carpet and the and the curtains and really? the walls and interesting and music rooms. Some people are like yeah. that. Yeah, man, I'll play. Just give me a phone book. I'll play that. <laughs> I would imagine that. Yeah, that's that actually brings up a good point. You probably sold to a lot of people outside the industry. A lot surgeons, of professional people like that. Right. Yeah. That you know maybe. Well, what's his name? Uh, the guy who sells insurance, Jeff Wald. Oh yeah, Jeff. Wald. Yeah, yeah. He's uh, he's kind of a I guess not a hobbyist. Uh, well, I guess he is. No, right? he, he's a great drummer. Yeah, incredible drummer. But he's smart. He has a real job. He's got the real <laughs> job. He pay, pays him a lot of money, and it's recurring. Sure. And he's got a beautiful kit for sure. Yeah, it's kind of like the guy that gets to be my age and buys his first Harley. Oh, right. is, is that what happened? No, 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 no. Are no, you going to do that? Me. You've no. always had I, motorcycles. I bought my first John Deere tractor. <laughs> is it big and green? Yes, it is. <clears throat> can well, you make Harry, it go slow and make it go faster? Yes, I we can. had Harry McCarthy last week, and he said that he was talking about his. Um, I said, well, "You got any hobbies? Is you got time for hobbies? As busy as we are, he likes motorcycles. Yeah, and golf. golfing. Yeah, yeah he likes so golf. you you got you're the tractor guy. Is uh, is it a big green tractor? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can you make it go slow? Make it go faster? Is this a what is that? That's the bum. Not a bum. Ah, oh, this is when this is when the the guest gets a little bit snooze festy. We, <laughs> we turn on the, uh, the crickets. Well, that might be Gary because I gave him black coffee and he wanted some sugar. I didn't oh, have any sugar. I'm so oh, this is a great conversation. It is a great conversation. Yeah. Is it, what you know? If you had any advice to an up and coming business owner or an up and coming drummer who's moving to Nashville, he's got stars in his eyes. He's 21 years old. He just graduated from a music school. He wants to go out. What would you, you know, all this years of wisdom, what would you share with these? You know, a lot of guys would come to town and come to the store before they moved here. Yeah. And I would say Nashville's a great town to live in, whether you get to play with a country music star or, or yeah. do sessions or not there's lots of work in town it's a healthy economy and it's yeah. just a good place to live mm -hmm. so but i would say you know tell them that they're gonna have to do what you did park cars and mm -hmm. wait tables and and go sit in with anybody that will let you play it's true take any gig that for any kind of money just to to get in there and and get your name mentioned and then um you know there's a brotherhood of drummers that we all pal up together and but you really should come in and meet guitar players yeah mm -hmm. you know you should make some friends with some guitar players so that they will hire you well yeah. you said the songwriters drive the economy this, yeah. right? this is a songwriting driven economy they, they rule the roost we work for them mm -hmm. we bring their visions to life mm -hmm. and i tell the yeah the kids you're always gonna have that drum brotherhood and you want to keep that strong and be part of that community but it's always going to be a band, a producer, a record label, a songwriter mm -hmm. that's going to hire you. Ultimately, mm -hmm. it's going to hire you. That's right. Yeah. Do you see that changing? That that hustle changing over time uh, in the past couple of years? Yeah. You know? With the well, with the millennials. Yeah. These yeah. Friends. Well, it just <laughs> the the thing that I I asked Jerry Croon this one time, who had has probably came to Nashville in the seventies. Who I studied with. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he saw writers writing songs for Elvis or. George Jones or those people and then we saw Garth get his fame and everybody in town was trying to write a song to sell to Garth and right. so there needs to be that those artists that songwriters want to write songs for and that's mm -hmm. what gets all the demos going and songwriting and keeps everybody busy and when when there's not that kind of person around then everybody suffers from it yeah yeah, but just the name of the game is to get out there and, 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 and be seen and shout your talents from a mountaintop and do a great job for people and don't burn any bridges and have a smile on your face and be enthusiastic and, you know, know the, know the genre, know the idiom. The first thing I did when I came to town is, is join the union, go to Forks Drum Closet, start shaking some hands. I went to The Great Escape and I bought everybody's greatest hits on cassette. <laughs> and I learned... Tammy Wynette and yeah. George Jones and Merle Haggard and I learned how to speak that language. Isn't it just learning a train beat? 
<laughs> no. You know, I I used to sub. For, Here it comes. Uh, there we go. A guy named Billy West down in the in the old Printer's Alley when all the uh, country music places were down there, and uh, I hadn't been playing country music. I'd been playing funk and R and B. Yeah, and me pop too. And right, rock right, right, and right. so they'd call a song off, and I'd look at the guitar player, and he'd go straight eight. Four on the floor. Shuffle. Country shuffle. He, he got me through Good all his gigs. Mm-hmm. He yeah. knew how to speak drum language. Beautiful. And um, so, yeah, you need to know all that stuff. Somebody tells you to play a train beat or get a pair of brushes out or whatever. So you say straight eighths, four on the floor, that's... Straight four on the floor is kind of like the old Waylon Jennings. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just, just kicking all along. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. Mm-hmm. You know who was really... Oh, another guy that was great to me was George... Lawrence, because mm-hmm. he was teaching at your store in yep. 1997, and I had my gigantic box of cassette demos, Rich Redmond Drums and Percussion. I had 400 of them. <laughs> I gave him one. He listened to it, and he goes, all right, train beat? And I and I said, yeah. I sat behind the kit, and I played it. He goes, all right, I'll, I'll start throwing your name around. And he got me gigs. <laughs> Tommy Wells got me gigs. Lonnie yep. Wilson got me gigs. Eddie Bears. I had Eddie Bears on the show a couple weeks ago. Lonnie's coming in. It's great. So you went out. Did anybody do what you were doing back then with cassette tape? You know, handing them out like you did, like your business card. I, I mean, I got a lot of flack for a lot of things. But, <laughs> when you yeah. first met Rich, what was your impression like? All right, dude. He's got, this guy's got Dial a lot of energy. Guy. He's got a ton of energy, uh-huh. uh, he, but he was always friendly. He's always mm-hmm. nice, never arrogant or, you know, just he was, uh, you knew he was going to get a good gig and amount to something because he worked so hard at it. Woo. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired, guys. No, but I mean, I, yeah, I mean, good things happen. You know, you work hard, you know. It's amazing. Over time. This takes time. It does take time. It always it's, takes time. There's, that's the one thing I, and Jim and I talk about millennials. It's just so funny. It's like it's becoming like a joke into itself. But I just have noticed that there is a difference in in the work ethic and the the patience. Mm-hmm. You know, and I was I was in a hurry. I was like, I want to do this now, man. I'm ready. I put in my time. Little did I realize that it was, it was going to come down to a person that was going to open the door for me or, or give my name to another person. And I, I just learned you, you couldn't, I couldn't mail it in. I couldn't have a bad day because every, somebody was going to be in that room watching mm-hmm. and the kids seemed to be in such a rush. They're like, well, I got my degree from Berkeley and I owe $250,000 back. How am I going to do they this? They told me I'd be able to do this. No. <laughs> I got an, I got a trophy for sixth place. Come well, and universities are teaching kids how to play, you know, all their modes and scales. They're not teaching business they're not teaching you how to get it yeah selling mm-hmm. yeah is, is the one thing i impart to my kids constantly is how to sell um yeah. i auditioned for a gig and i didn't get it and the guy who had it decided to come back and play and and but in the meantime the guitar player in the band said go take some lessons with this guy his, his name was clay care and he was he did the nashville now tv show for like right. 10 years used he used to, to watch do, that on cable used to do a lot of sessions and uh uh, so we didn't work on rudiments or it, we worked on he taught me how to read the number system nice he taught me how to tune my drums for the studio um, he taught me how to work mm-hmm. and and that was really valuable so that that needs to be more in the curriculum definitely rather than uh, and then there's thank you know thank God there's guys like you know Jim Riley that are le- leveling the playing field and you know guys that are working in the community that are doing outreach and you know, I've got my uh, fifth annual Drummers Weekend that's coming up October 19 and 20. And my teachers are Larry Aberman, who played with uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan. And he did like 12 or maybe longer, at least 12 years of the Zumanity show in Las Vegas. Lots of um, people. Daru Jones, who we had uh, a couple weeks ago as a mm-hmm. guest. And he is was with Jack White. He's going to be teaching. And then who's my other teacher? Ah, Jim McCarthy. Mr. Joe Vitali from Crosby, Stills, and Nash is coming. So these guys are sharing their insights and knowledge, the practical information of being in the real music business. So Joe Vitale is one of my heroes. Yeah, well, you have he, to come by. We played uh, with Joe Walsh for such a long time. They 40 years. grew up together yeah. in Canton, I think. Mm-hmm. He's an excellent keyboard player. He plays flute. Yeah. He writes. Hmm. He actually played organ on a demo, a song that I wrote, a friend of mine, that lives up in Ohio. Yeah. He played organ on it. You should stop so. by. We're going to do it October 19 and 20 over at the Nashville School of Rock. Um, That's off of yeah, Franklin? My, 
I, I don't. It's <clears throat> it's here in the Nashville area. I got to get the 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 address. I think it's over uh, by Belmont University. But um, Angie and Kelly McCright they run that, and they always have the best school of rock in the nation. And, and your they, weekends are a must attend. Well, it's right? a, it's a thing where um, I usually would do a three day event. And you guys have sponsored us before. Thank you so much. And the kids would go home with forks, shirts, and koozies and all that. Um, I would do a 72-hour camp, which would be three days, three eight-hour days. And I decided, oh, I'm going to do two eight-hour days. And the feedback I was getting was, we love all the guests. We love Kenny Aronoff and Thomas Lang and Mark Schulman and but Jim we, McCarthy. We want to uh, Jim McCarthy is a yeah. music yeah. business talk. Right. Uh, we want to have a little bit more uh, training from you, Rich. Mm -hmm. It's your camp. I was like, great. So we do we do rudiments, we do reading, we do cheat chart creation, we do money beats, we do styles, um, and then the other clinicians come in and do their things. And then at the end, the kids get to play with a cool band, mm -hmm. and there's tons of door prizes, and I feed, feed them a catered lunch. So that's coming up. That's this this uh, year, guys. And if you're interested, just hit me up at the Redmond at gmail.com and we'll get you signed up. One of the highlights is the uh, the, the session of learning how to sell and, and position your resume. Uh, that time period, otherwise known as lunchtime. <laughs> so you, your, your book, dude, you come in and talk to the kids while they're stuffing their face with... Um, I was I was Chipotle. just joking. I mean, yeah. I'm like the snooze fest part. No, part. they they're like this is great. Yeah. yeah. No, I talk about how to you know selling techniques and stuff like that. Things to say, how to overcome objections, and uh, that kind of things. Mm -hmm. yeah, Mindful right. conditioning. Love it. This has been great. Are, yeah, buddy. I'm so excited about your your you know the the next period That's of your right. life, my new life. Yeah. Yeah. We we all have these uh, these seasons of life, and you know I feel like uh, you know I'll be coming up on fifty, so I'm thinking to myself, what do I what do I want to do with my next twenty years, thirty years? Oh. Rich De Niro, we're working on it. I got That's my right. SAG card. Dude. Rich Pacino. I've been studying acting for four years, and I busted my butt at great expense with Southwest Airlines and rental cars and Airbnbs and acting classes, and I got my SAG card. So we're right. off to the next. Levon Helm was a hey. great actor. Yeah. He, was, he was very natural. Yeah, Take that natural ability and turn it into something. Guys, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for rating, reviewing, subscribing, and sharing. It takes one minute to rate the show, one minute to review the show. Tell your friends. As always, Jim McCarthy, thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much for your Love sponsoring. It. Jim, uh, Jim McCarthy, voiceovers.com, big.lighting.com. Yeah. And our guest today, Mr. Gary Forkham. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, my friend. Thanks for having what me. a pleasure. Yeah. Guys, we'll see you next time. Tell a friend. I'm Rich Redmond. This is The Rich Redmond Show. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you soon. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.